The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode.
Hey everybody, we'll begin in the next few minutes. And good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Murphy. Uh, today we will begin with Masterclass Part 2, Multi-Layered Security Approach to Cybersecurity. Uh, I am here joined with my colleague, well, as soon as I click through here, uh, Jonathan Lawless, uh, Director of VCIO Services uh, within our Managed Services Division. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for joining. Um, I'm Jason Murphy. I'll be hosting today um, alongside Jonathan. Uh, Director of Sales Engineering here at our Managed Services Division. Uh, I'll be taking you through uh, um, what I deem is probably my most, probably my favorite part of our five-part series in layered security. Only because I really love talking about the different aspects of uh, the layered security approach to um, to IT uh, IT security. So uh, let's begin. Uh, as, a, as a piece of housekeeping, uh, before we begin, uh, if you do have any questions, if the audio is poor, or if you have anything you want to ask questions about, obviously uh, feel free to either raise your hand um, or even just use the, the chat method with, within the GoToWebinar. Okay, so uh, before I begin, I always like to set the, set the stage, let you know who we are uh, here at, uh, at CareWorks. Um, we are a top 40 managed service provider. Uh, here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, currently, we have about 60,000 devices under our management. Uh, that is across 4,400 locations across North America um, and even some in the UK. Uh, we also have uh, roughly, we generate, um, our, our customers are generating roughly around 500,000 tickets annually um, across about 1,500 customers. So of those 1,500 customers, they have you know, roughly around uh, 4,400 locations. And we service roughly around a million end users across uh, all of those devices. Now, what do we do? Okay, so first and foremost, we do managed ITSM. Managed ITSM in the form of ServiceNow. We have two flavors of ServiceNow. One is a pre-built instance ready to go, what we call ServiceNow in a box 
or ServiceNow as a service, but we also do full-on ServiceNow Enterprise as well. To that effect, we also do 24 by 7 Service Desk. This is a white glove uh, service desk operation based out of Prince Edward Island, Canada. Uh, we have a division over there. And uh, the good news is, is that we would white label um, you know, that particular service desk for you know, mid-market and enterprise companies. We also do, uh, and this is what I would deem kind of traditional managed services, monitoring, automation, and security. Obviously, the focus today is around security, but we also monitor um, you know, different uh, solutions, um, and we also uh, use automation within those solutions to keep devices up and running and proactive all of the time. And remote system administration. This ties into the managed ITSM piece through ServiceNow. So if you have ServiceNow, uh, we also act as a professional services shop for uh, maintaining ServiceNow, um, but also we do remote uh, system administration for uh, that particular ecosystem within our own Grand Central. So as a part of maintaining that uh, pre-built, uh, ready-to-go instance, we maintain that uh, for uh, many, many companies. Okay, so let's start with layered security. What is layered security? Okay, and I wrote a kind of big text blur, but in short, the idea is an obvious one that any single defense may be flawed. Okay, now I'll get into the kind of the attack vectors as we proceed through. And the most certain way to find the flaws is to be compromised by an attack. So a series of different defenses should be used to cover the gaps in the other's protective capabilities. And, and what this basically means is uh, through those, uh, and we use what is called a, the Lockheed Martin um, cyber kill chain is that through that those attack vectors, uh, what happens is we need to layer in security through that, that chain. Firewalls, intrusion detection systems, malware scanners, integrity auditing procedures, which by the way, uh, just to kind of segue back into Jonathan Lawless, he will do uh, a little a little blurb on on a lot of the the kind of the auditing and and uh, procedural stuff, um, and local storage encryption tools that uh, tools can each serve to protect your information technology resources in the ways others cannot. Now, before I kind of get into uh, threat actors and their motivation, one thing I will tell you is that their layered security is not the only approach. Uh, I will talk uh, briefly about another approach. Um, but they obviously um, they kind of work in conjunction with each, with, each, with each other, if I can spit that out. Okay, so the threat actors and their motivation. Who's, who's up to all of this nefarious uh, financial destruction within, within the, uh, um, the kind of the cybersecurity ecosystem? 58% uh, of the threats target small business. So it doesn't really matter how big your enterprise is. Or if you're, you know, the the pizzeria with you know five different locations across the city, you are still a target, and that is sometimes very difficult to get across to not only our customers but the people I talk to day in day out. Uh, a lot of people feel like, hey, you know, I'm I'm just a small piece of the pie here. Why why are people trying to uh, target me? But the, the 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 better question is, how are you protecting yourself? And I'll get into. Uh, my approaches with uh, risk versus security in just a little bit. 50% 50, 50 of the breach is carried out by organized criminal groups. And I'll start with organized crime as number one as I proceed. Um, but it's a very interesting vertical. Um, you will notice that most, half, uh, of those breaches are carried out by organized criminal groups. 76% of breaches were financially motivated. You know, so what about the other 24? And we'll talk about those, those insiders, those hacktivists in just a moment as well. 140 targeted attack groups use spear phishing, uh, are, are utilized around 71% uh, of the time. So spear phishing is obviously the kind of number one go-to in terms of um, getting malware, um, ransomware, for example, uh, on those systems. Right, so spear phishing is is obviously you know email itself is is really kind of an easy go to, right? Now, organized crime, evolving adversary, 
risk and chip and pin removed revenue stream. You have to understand that in terms of organized crime, we're not just talking about, you know, the mafia, right? These criminal groups are very well organized. Um, they're located all over the world. Um, I even watched a documentary uh, probably about a month and a half ago uh, where there was an organized criminal group in uh, or in um, in Russia. And, you know, the, this was like a, a warehouse full of really, really smart and young um, you know, women and men who were literally trying to penetrate into systems in the United States. Now, that being said, um, let's talk about, you know, the nation state, right? When we're getting into cybersecurity, I think uh, a lot of the crossfire that happens, you know, maybe here in uh, Canada, Australia, the UK, is that, um, you know, there are governments who are actively using, you know, um, their political control um, to create conflict across uh, across the world and cyber terrorists using fear and it's a matter of time now this may be my favorite one um, only because you know we we typically read about cyber terrorism in in the news right where we're hearing lots about North Korea the United States maybe the UK there is lots of different cyber terrorism that is going on across the uh, across the world. Uh, one thing um, that I read out of Symantec uh, recently was that um, we're going to start seeing uh, the effect of cyber ter terrorism in a what a, what was deemed by um, the the security um, person from Symantec as a pandemic. Um, so it's just a matter of time before there is a catastrophe, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, but we have to be prepared. We have to prepare our businesses. We have to prepare, prepare ourselves, right? Um, more and more often, um, people are, you know, looking to hit our energy grids. Um, they are looking to hit uh, major enterprises uh, across the world, not only just for financial gain, um, but unfortunately for, um, you know, kind of that nefarious um, uh, thing as well. Uh, insiders. Now, Insiders are, you know, sometimes typically ourselves, uh, people who have access to data, right? Sometimes those are employees within our companies. Uh, we have to be able to protect ourselves from insiders and limit the access that insiders have. And hacktivists. This is probably, I would say, the number two that we get to read about. Everybody's probably heard about Anonymous. Uh, there's about, you know, there's LulzSec. There's, there's a bunch of different groups out there. Um, they're very unpredictable, um, often, you know, oftentimes politically motivated as well, and they're very difficult to defend against. Um, and it's one of those things where, um, you know, hacktivists are using, um, I think what we call the, the white knight syndrome of the internet to take down, um, you know, certain companies or, or, or even political groups. So how do we protect ourselves in, and our customers in this world? Um, you need to understand and manage cybersecurity um, and cybersecurity and risk as you understand and ma manage business risk, right? So, you know, if you've ever been through an acquisition, there's things like due diligence. You have to be able to mitigate any kind of exposure to your business through things like insurance or, or obviously a, a proper legal framework. So we need to you know, apply a lot of... Um, that best practice into cybersecurity as well. So when I talk about security, I also try to, especially when I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk kind of more layman's um, uh, with our customers or when I'm doing kind of these types of presentations is that I like to focus on, on risk. You know, I can get into the speeds and feeds of, of security. Um, I've been working in IT security um, probably since 2003. Um, you know, I've been doing IT for just over 20 years. It's one of those things where you have to make it resonate, right? So I always like to classify our customers into these three different segments, you know, based on their business. And sometimes there is some overlap, right? You know, there is some, some things that are a high risk. There are some things that are low risk and medium risk. So you need to draw a, a clear line in terms of what these, these are. And obviously feel free to, to take a, a screenshot of this and, and, 
and use it within your own presentations or uh, for your own learning. Um, when you want to understand who has access to your data, um, what is your layered security approach, which we'll talk about just as we go through, you know, you, you need to understand where your risk is, right? Then you can start applying layered security and, 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 and those speeds and feeds as we call it. Okay. Now, that being said, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain, and, and this is something that I've been spending a lot of time um, on uh, since um, I was, you know, kind of getting more and more into cybersecurity. Um, this is five of, I believe, seven or eight uh, different um, attack verticals, right? So when you're looking at how malware gets installed, right? You know, this is a kind of a simplified version. But if you look at this in each stage of that cyber, cyber kill chain, you can then layer in um, defense, right? Now let's start with delivery, email protection, exploitation, you know, attack service reduction using things like you know, patch management or behavior-based um, uh, behavior uh, malware scanners. Uh, installation, you know, harding systems in G using GPOs, right? Removing admin or generic admins, right? Um, I'll get into uh, what C2 is. It's kind of a very important part of the cyber kill chain. Um, command and control is what it, it actually stands for. The important part here is that this is where you get into things like, you know, perimeter security, right? You know, you know next generation firewall technology, network segmentation, um, using things like uh, a SIM solution, SIEM. Right? This is where you can start logging events and then correlating those events into intelligence and then actions, right? What can we do, right? Using things like HIDs, antivirus, back and recovery. You know, this is what happens when, when all else fails, right? Um, so obviously heuristic AV. Now heuristic is really a kind of a, a, a fancy term for something like machine learning um, or artificial intelligence which are, are really good, um, in my opinion, really good marketing terms around heuristics, but they are algorithms that are running in real time um, on the operating system to then do, you know, prevent something like a, a ransomware encryption on your endpoint. Okay. So the next thing I would like to talk about outside of layered security is what is defense in depth. Now, the two are complementary to, to, the, uh, to the other. Um, they do overlap each other, but they are not the same. So let's talk about layered, layered security and then I'll talk about uh, defense in depth. Layered security arises from the desire to cover for the failings of each component by combining the components into a single comprehensive strategy, right? So you have an overall defense, the whole of which is greater than the sum of its parts, focused on technology implementation with, the, with an artificial goal of securing the entire system against threats, right? So layering in technology across those, those five attack verticals. Defense in depth, by contrast, arises from the philosophy that there is no real possibility of achieving a total complete security against threats by implementing any collection of security solutions. Rather, technological components of a layered security strategy are regarded as stumbling blocks, which which are still good, um, that hinder uh, the process of a, of a threat, slowing and frustrating it until it either ceases to threaten or some additional resources, not strictly technological, uh, technological in nature, can be bought to bear. And the reason why I want to talk about defense in depth is there are other components of security um, like governance, right? like policy, right? And, and that's really where Jonathan comes in and works with our customers and the, and the people who we do business with. And he, from a, a top level, you know, you know virtual CIO, um, comes in and, and brings that intelligence to uh, our customer base. So to kind of segue over to uh, my good friend and colleague, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, hi there. Um, 
just picking up on where uh, where Jason left off there with regards to the governance and the the, uh, the policy side of, of IT security. Um, everybody seems and typically focuses on the technology, the hardware, um, the pieces that are, are physically seen and, and are physically interacting with your data and, and with the with the threats on the outside. But there are there's a lot of in the background things that we can do to to add security and to to really uh, prop up the security of the organization. Um, it's critical right now, uh, as you can see with uh, with things going on in terms of compliance and data security, data privacy, and, and the idea of employees having access to all sorts of data, no matter where they are, that we need to try to keep a lid on things and, and understand where the risks are to the organization, uh, not just from a technology standpoint, but from our from our, our own uh, people resources as well. So it's really important as an organization that we, we go back to basics and do some of the housekeeping that uh, typically is either done through, um, you know, initially done as, as checking a box when we start the organization and we were going through, you know, what do we need to put in place when we start hiring employees or what do we need to put in place for, for a specific client uh, and go back to basics to really understand what the risks are uh, to the organization in general. So the three main ones that, that I wanted to point out just being putting our IT policies and, and general business policies in place, reviewing them on a more frequent basis and, and really taking a look at what uh, what we want as an organization in terms of control over whether it's a mobile device or, or removable media uh, or an overall acceptable use of our data and, and of our network resources. So not accepting you know the initial policy that was created five years ago, but, but taking a real look at uh, the policy now and on a regular basis uh, with the changes that occur in, in every organization. So, you know, five, seven years ago, was it as common for people to walk in with their mobile device that was already connected to all our data and plug it into their machines? Or is it as acceptable to walk in and connect to the Wi-Fi with a device that's not necessarily corporately owned? Uh, probably not as prevalent and not something that we needed to think about then, but it is definitely something that we need to, to consider now. Um, in terms of uh, incident management, um, incident response planning, it's, it's critical to plan ahead for the inevitable, which will be an attack of some sort, whether it's successful or not is to be determined, but there will be an attack or a threat of some kind to the organization. So understanding who you need to call, documenting out the procedure of who is to be called, um, where, what number is it that we're going to reach out to, what order are we calling people in and then how we're going to respond, um, understanding what the risks are and what we're willing to accept before taking certain steps so that when you're under threat, you're not making those decisions uh, during, during that time. Um, you know, uh, one of the tips that we've received over the last little while and I got at a security conference that I've taken with me was the very first step under any threat or under any attack, uh, once you realize that there's a threat or attack in place, is to call your lawyer or call the, the legal counsel for the organization and then operate the entire response under direction from that lawyer, uh, simply from a, from a privacy and a, um, uh, from that aspect, nothing becomes publicly accessible and so it's a little easier to protect your brand that way. Um, but having that plan in place drastically reduces the time it takes for you to respond, the time it takes the organization to get control over the threat, uh, and the time it takes and the cost of the overall impact of that is, is drastically reduced. Now, John, uh, if, if I can interrupt for one yeah. quick sec. Um, I, I know just in my dealings with our customers, they, they often shy away from kind of security um, because they think that's money out of the kind of the right. business pocket, right? But a lot of what you're describing seems just internal process driven, like being able to, again, check those boxes, you know, get back to ba basics and really have a, a streamlined um, incident response, we'll call it, um, to be able to ensure that we've, we've done all of the right things Absolutely. internally. Yeah, and it, I think it comes down, number one, to a lot of times not knowing where to start. Um, and so they, you know, companies put it off or they, they rest on their laurels with what they have or there's a, they're an associated cost that they're concerned about. And I think for the most part, most organizations can, can take what they've, what they got already or, or at least enlist the help of their, their MSP, a consultant of some sort, or even uh, someone internal that's, that's had some experience and just get started, put something together, uh, itemizing the steps and then every, every six months to, to a year, build on that and make it into a, to something a lot more detailed, a little more effective. Um, one of the most effective ways to do that is to do post-incident response overviews. Uh, it's probably the least performed step in the whole process, but one of the most effective because you can go back and see what happened, what worked, what didn't work, and then you can modify your process from there and, and tighten things up or put things in place to try to prevent that from happening again. Right, and, and from a kind of IT service management point of view, I really see that as kind of your 
your incident problem management, right? Like, yeah. you know, understanding that there is a problem that we can improve. That's that continuous exactly. and kind of ITIL improvement method that you have to go back and review your policies and procedures and ensure that you're doing things, you know, optimal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and obviously from the, from the process side of things and the planning side of things, the other big risk is employees and, uh, and their, their either lack of knowledge or their, their uh, incidental misuse of data or, or allowing of a, a threat into the organization. Um, and so the third step being, we need to make sure that we're still training our people. Um, it, it's obviously, you know, over the years has evolved to, you know, sometimes they check, again, check the box. We need to make sure everybody's trained, uh, but it's a critical piece of the puzzle. And uh, we see it more and more and more, especially in the, the small to mid-sized businesses where uh, phishing temps or social engineering is, is done just to try to get access, try to get some sort of money or, or breach within the, the organization, or even simply the fact of a disgruntled employee walking out um, or even an employee walking out with information they didn't know they had. Uh, and then that information is, is become public access that you really didn't want out there. So it's important to keep up with the training. There's so many new tools out now that, that are no longer sort of the, what they used to call the, the web tours, which is a click through training where you read some things and, and, and hope that that sinks in. There's much more effective, shorter, um, real world type scenario training where you can, you can run people through stuff that's a lot more relevant to their day to day and it's a lot more likely to stick. So, uh, really where to start there is to identify where the threats are to your, to your staff, whether that's email you think is a threat or whether it's removable media or, or, you know, remote access and then find some tools, some training that you can constantly update people on and create that security culture within the organization that, that has people aware of, of, uh, of their role within keeping the data safe in the organization. Yeah. And I've, I've heard of those situations. I know we use a tool internally where, you know, we'll, we'll work with the, the customer on, you know, sending out a kind of a test spam link and then we can see who has then, you know, click through and gone through that social engineering exercise. And at least then we have a, a coachable opportunity to, to now train um, and do enhanced training. Uh, with yeah, those. That's exactly the type of tool. Right. Cool. So yeah, there's uh, more information on the, on the training side of things in terms of what's effective and, and, and what is not in the older sort of longer um, read only type training. It works for a certain amount of time, but for the most part, most information isn't retained. So the, the goal would be to keep the training as relevant as you can and, and to find some tools that, that really relate to your, uh, to your staff and, and what, they, what they do on a daily basis. Excellent. Thanks, John. Okay, so um, you know, I did want to bring John in because not everything in layered security is kind of software-based. And, and oftentimes, you, you think of layered security as, as a... Uh, technology solution that we must implement. And that is definitely a component in, in layered security. But uh, just to summarize, you know, obviously there is policy, procedure, and governance that we can incorporate as well. Uh, I just want to go through a couple, you know, you know, we all have a, probably a good idea of what the most common you know, types of cyber attacks are. Um, you know, you know, when, when Amazon goes down because uh, half the internet on the eastern seaboard goes down because of a DDoS, um, that, that, typically that makes the news, right? So we, we hear about those things. But, you know, there's also things like what we're talking about, you know, spear phishing campaigns, you know, social engineering, getting, um, you know, things through our spam filters so that it ends up in our inbox so that it looks like a legitimate email. And this is how CEO fraud is 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 completed because as soon as it may, uh, there's a personalized email to the CFO or CEO, um, you can do some very crafty things like, you know, bank transfers. Um, that's a common one that uh, that I've heard about. Um, but once where our endpoints are are infected with malware, we then you know contribute to a, a bigger overall overarching problem, which is that botnet. Right, we become part of the command and control. Right, they use our endpoints as a vehicle. Right, and that is oftentimes, um, you know, something that we're very much unaware of. Right, it, it, we're we're part of the botnet, but we we don't feel it. Right, so having that that nasty uh, software on our on our computer computers is is really outside of us. So obviously having 
you know, the sophisticated means to really be able to track and prevent those things. Uh, web application CSS, SQL injection is probably another common one. Um, that's been around for decade, well, a decade, if not longer. Um, it, it's one of those things where when you expose any kind of website to the internet, typically there is a database in the back end uh, where you can actually inject code um, into it to kind of glean information out, things like passwords. Um, you know, making sure that your your passwords and your databases are salted and hashed correctly, um, but it's also things like email addresses, right? So there's a number of things that we have to do internally to be able to protect our data. Okay. The relation, relationship between exploit, Trojan, and payload is key, right? Now, I love this graphic. Hey, there's some bombs on the screen. They're falling to the earth. You know, disaster is about to strike, right? Now, as someone who, I, I mean, I've worked in uh, IT security for a while now. Um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, I like to understand, you know, what is going on uh, with our customers, um, but even with with myself, um, I am. I use a sandbox at home, which is, which is called a honeypot. Um, but the realization that uh, kind of data is the new gold—that's where where I got kind of got this image from—is that um, we really need to start understanding that there's a monetary value to these ones and zeros that are residing on, you know, all of our different pieces of technology, right? And when we look at the when we can quantify and monetize uh, that data, then we can start doing some very uh, important things around securing it, right? Now, what is a honeypot? Uh, a honeypot is, again, like a sandbox. They are a, a computer or a sets of computers or clients that are set up with the purpose of attracting and logging cybersecurity attacks in real time. And that's... You know, this is and this isn't really part of a layered security approach, but I did want to include it because, you know, it's not just a defensive method. Sometimes we can still get information that allows us intelligence to to really perform a, a proper uh, defensive method, right? Often, you know, for example, you can put a sandbox on the internet so that, you know, if a botnet is to um, you know, for example, hit your machine or your firewall, you can, you can start logging that information and then you can reverse engineer it and then start blacklisting, right? That's where honeypots come in. And a lot of enterprise use these honeypots, but now they're starting to trickle down into what I would call mid-market IT, um, you know, kind of your medium enterprise or larger small businesses, right? And then it can be used to, to monitor various protocols, applications, or oper operating system attacks. Right. As mentioned in the botnet literature, honeypot log files can be used for identifying new botnets, right, and observing malware, right. So it, it's one of those things where a honeypot be, can become very, very important in terms of a an overall uh, defensive method. Okay. Now, once malware has landed, it must reach out to a command and control C2 bot network to receive instructions. You have to understand. If you were to, and I, I wrote a blog recently on the anatomy of ransomware, is that um, when you when you understand what happens with ransomware, you know, for example, it's your end user clicking a link, right, in a you know spear phishing campaign, that that link is then now requesting information from you know a server um, in another country, right, now. That's where we can do some very interesting things, right? When it starts receiving those instructions is when all of the, all of the damage starts to occur, right? Now, what happens in that, in that botnet or that C2 is that, you know, we're all just acting like zombies, right? And I love, I love this image, right? You know, be organized, be prepared, be safe. These are the things that we can do as IT professionals, um, you know, business stakeholders, right? We we have control to prevent, and 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 like the like the the saying in IT security goes, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It will happen to you. It will happen to all of us. So we need to make sure that we're making things as tough as possible um, um, before obviously becoming part of the the problem ourselves. 
So what is a command and control, right? Remotely control the implant, okay? There's two sides of this, the equation. There's the adversary, and then we have the defender, right? Now on the adversary side, the, the attacker, malware opens a command channel to enable the adversary to remotely manipulate the victim, okay? So again, infecting a bunch of, uh, a bunch of endpoints, right? You know, using them as a botnet. Opening a two-way communications channel to the C2 infrastructure, right? Most common C2 channels are over web, DNS, and email protocols, right? Again, that kind of intelligence allows us to make um, you know, strict policies through our firewall um, so that, again, we're not becoming part of that problem. C2, C2 infrastructure may be adversary owned or another victim network itself. Again, you could be part of the problem without even knowing it, right? So that's where we need to have the proper intelligence, the proper policies and procedures internally to make sure that we're mitigating uh, any of those things. You know, are we using, um, you know, HIDs, NIDs, you know, the latest and greatest, you know, uh, anti-malware strategies, okay? And now as a defender, the last best chance to block the operation by blocking the C2 channel. If adversaries can't issue commands, defenders can not prevent impact, right? Discover C2 infrastructure through malware analysis, right? Now, um, I've been working with in kind of the malware, um, the anti-malware um, product circle for a very long time. So I've worked for um, various vendors who supply, um, you know, what we call AV or anti-malware. Um, I have my own uh, kind of criteria as to what is the latest and greatest te technologies. And just to kind of throw a few names out there, um, there are things like Carbon Black. There are, you know, companies like Sentinel One. Um, and I'm just throwing a few that are out there off the top of my head. But Bitdefender is also one of the number one rated uh, anti-malware solutions on the planet. But there, there's, you know, I would say, a, a definitely a top five. And if you go to abtest.com, you can see um, kind of what their ratings are, where they're stronger, where they're weaker, right? Harden the network, consolidate the number of uh, internet pain points, right? Require proxies. Now this is, this is where we get into some more advanced methods where setting up a proxy isn't for every business, um, but these are strategies that you can incorporate. Customize blocks of C2 protocols on web proxies, proxy category blocks, including none or uncategorized domains, right? And this is where you get into whitelisting and blacklisting. DNS sinkholes or using something like OpenDNS. Conduct open source research to discover new adversary and C2 infrastructure. That's where that honeypot comes in. That's where your own intelligence comes in, right? Now, to summarize, you know, what is layered security? It's really a simple, a simple approach to being able to defend, right? Now, when we're looking at our devices internally, you know, there's things like operating system, antivirus, anti-malware, firewalls, IDS, intrusion detection systems, and of course, you, right? Nobody wants to be the guy on the right, you know? And I have seen this myself, um, you know, not just here at CareWorks, but previous companies uh, to me being here where Somebody has clicked something, and next thing they know, they're 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 in a little bit of hot water. The unfortunate part is, at least today, we kind of accept it. You know, I'll, I'll give you a prime example. Um, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say a heavy Facebook user, but you know, I go on from on Facebook from time to time, and a, one of my good friends sent me a, a video, and it looked legitimate to me. You know, it was just a normal video, um, but he didn't put any context to it. So, I, anyways, I clicked on, it. and. Next thing I know, I quickly realized that that was not uh, from him. So immediately, you know, I'm now part of the problem, right? Um, for example, I could have communicated my my passwords. Um, I could have actually started sending that out to all of my users or all of my friends on, 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 my, on my Facebook. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, these social engineering attacks look very, very legitimate, even to somebody who's been doing this for a long, long time. Right, so we have to have strategies around common sense, teaching and training our end users. Right, behavioral blockers using something like intrusion detection. This is where you know you know firewall technology comes into play. Right, or at least software firewalls using uh, anti-malware. 
Connection blockers using, again, next generation firewall technology. Real-time protection in the form of anti-malware. Your primary defense is obviously the endpoint on using a, a solid AV strategy. And of course, patch. Now, I won't talk too much about patch because I'm doing a whole webinar on patch management, uh, uh, part four, I believe. Uh, Jonathan's going to go in more depth uh, uh, next week or the week after, I should say, um, when he gets into his incident yeah incident response uh, webinar. So he'll he'll go more in depth about incident response, which is the next one that's up. Um, but then I'll be talking about uh, patch management. Um, that being said, um, you patch the application, you patch you patch the um, the operating system, you patch the hardware. Those are three sound strategies in, in patch management. Okay, now how do we do it at CareWorks? You know, this is uh, a slide um, that kind of indicates layered security, right? And, and obviously, in the top left-hand corner, we have secure the perimeter. You know, you know, using the latest and greatest, greatest technologies in terms of next-generation firewalls. You know, uh, we use a few vendors internally. You know, uh, Cisco, Cisco Meraki, Palo Alto, um, but it's not limited to just the, those vendors. You know, there's a lot of great companies doing uh, next generation firewall technology built in uh, to the uh, perimeter security approach. Uh, secure the web, right? How do we secure the web? Using advanced protection control and insights that, if, that is effective and affordable, right? Limiting the, the protocols, for example. Secure the email, probably, um, in a layered security approach, one of the most important, right? You have to be able to use uh, anti-spam, right? And securing the email, right? And of course, securing the wireless. This is what we do on the network side of things. Then we have the end user approach, right? Secure the endpoint, next gen endpoint security, right? That's where we get into you know, antivirus, anti-malware. Secure the mobile device using something like an, a mobile device management solution, right? Protect the data. Are you encrypting, right? You know, if you have laptops or if your users have laptops or if you own laptops, you need to encrypt the data, okay? And securing the servers. That being said, uh, my name is Jason Murphy. Um, you can reach out to me at infosec at careworks.com or Jason Murphy at careworks.com. Uh, also, if you want more information about um, uh, Jonathan or from Jonathan, uh, jonathan.lalas at careworks.com. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, James, this is a recorded recorded uh, webinar. Uh, absolutely. Um, if you want to actually send me a quick email, jason.murphy at careworks.com, I will personally forward you uh, a copy of this presentation. Okay, everybody, thank you for your time today. Bye-bye.